All right, well, welcome. Again, you are in the secondary, the middle and high school family webinar. My name is Diane Bradford. I'm the communications and public relations director for the district. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how this evening's gonna go, similar to past town halls or family webinars. We have some content to share with you. Um, we have at least one opportunity for you to engage. And then at the end, we have some time set aside for you to enter any remaining questions, or thoughts or, or comments about uh, in-person learning for middle and high school students. With the time remaining at the end, we'll answer as many questions as we can. Uh, we also will be able to keep all of those questions uh, so that we can refer to those later and uh, weave those into future communications and answer them as we have answers to provide. Um, I wanna first start off too by, um, oh, I wanna mention too that we are recording tonight's um, event. Uh, so we'll share that out with families and post it on the website within a day or two. Tomorrow night, we're offering the same information for Spanish-speaking families, uh, and that will be um, from 5.30 to 7 p.m. With that, I want to start by introducing the presenters. We have four presenters tonight, and as well as some cabinet members who will help us answer questions at the end of this webinar. So I mentioned my name is Diane Bradford, Communications Director. Uh, Dr. Brunelson, you want to go next? Sure, thanks, Diane. My name is Allison Brennelson and I am the superintendent. Welcome. I am Pat Hagerty. I am the executive director of secondary education. Good evening, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Cindy Steigerwald. I am the director of transportation and safety for the district. And the other cabinet members, I'll just kind of go around, make sure that we cover everybody. So starting the first person on my screen is Patty. Hi, I'm Patty Dowd, Executive Director of Business Services. And Brooke. Good evening, everybody. My name is Brooke Trisler. I'm the Chief Technology Officer. Bruce. Good evening, everyone. I'm Bruce Holbert, Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Moseker, Executive Director of District Support Services. Thank you. Maria. Hello, everybody. My name is Maria Peña Mercado, and I serve as the Executive Director for Student Learning and Partnerships. Thank you for being here. And Heather. Hi, good evening. I'm Heather Tauyuk, Deputy Superintendent. Thanks, everybody. Okay, with that, I'm going to hand it on over to you, Dr. Brittleson. Thank you. We'd like to begin by acknowledging that we gather on ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish peoples who have lived in the Salish Sea Basin since time immemorial. We respect this place and honor the sacred spiritual connection to the land, water, and its people past, present, and future. By acknowledging these lands and their original indigenous inhabitants, we reach back to our own indigenous roots and reflect on the impacts of colonialism in the lands from which all of our people come. We are connected to our ancestors through this connection to land, for the land is what connects us all. Please join me in expressing our deepest respect and gratitude to the traditional people of this territory, the Snohomish and Tulalip tribes for their enduring care and protection of the land in which we currently share. So again, welcome everybody. Um, our last town hall was February 25th, and at that time it was really geared towards our elementary students and, and really our kindergarten through second grade students. So at that time, we were going to begin in-person learning for our ECAP students and for our students in grades second through kindergarten. Um, and about that same time that we had that town hall at the end of February, we were launching our third through fifth family and staff survey, as well as expanding our individual and small groups for secondary students. So I say that because a few weeks later, Governor Inslee, as you know, really changed the landscape for us, and he signed a proclamation. And in the proclamation, he dictated when we needed to return to in-person learning for all of our students and how much, how much time needed to be in person. So he stated that all students in elementary K through five needed, the, uh, needed to be given the option to return to in-person by April 5th um, because that was the week of our spring break. We were allowed to start our elementary students 
this Monday, yesterday. So our kindergarten through second grade was already in. We were able to start our third through fifth grade yesterday. And then middle and high school needed to be offered in person for those that wanted it on April 19th, which is Monday. So the second part of what was in his proclamation was that students needed to receive 30% of in-person learning based on how much time they were in school pre-COVID. And so for that, for our students, that meant that we needed an, at least an average of nine hours and 15 minutes a day for our students. So at elementary, students received 12 hours of instruction per week. And with our hybrid AB schedule, which Mr. Hegarty will go in more in depth on in a bit, um, we meet the nine hours and 15 minutes that is required. So soon after he made he signed that proclamation, he came up, uh, he made another change on March 25th. And on March 25th, uh, Governor Inslee announced that physical distancing requirements within all of our schools, our K-12 schools, would be changed to follow the most recent CDC guidance. And the CDC guidance prior to March 19th was there needed to be six feet of distancing, social distancing in our schools. And the guidance changed to be three feet distance between students. And so important components that went with that announcement that he made on March 25th is that schools could move towards the three feet distance for the remainder of the year, or they could choose to keep the six feet distance. However, schools that offer summer school, which would be our school district, and as we start school in the fall, we needed to move to the three feet distance. What's unusual about this is it really, the distance really pertains to students. It does not pertain to students and staff. So students and adults, the teachers still need to re, uh, remain six feet apart for, um, for, mo for six feet apart. And also when students are in common areas, such as the cafeteria, and they take off their masks and they're eating, they still need to remain six feet apart. So in struggling with, are we gonna move to the three feet? Are we gonna keep, keep six feet for the remainder of the year? We felt it best um, for our school district to maintain the six feet of distancing. Um, and it really, it had to do with, we didn't wanna change student and staff schedules again. And it didn't make sense for us to have more students in our classrooms. However, we still had the six feet of distancing required in common areas. Um, so a school that I like to use as an example is Olympic View. They can fit 90 students in their cafeteria and meet the six feet requirements because when kids are eating, they have to face the same way uh, a lot of our cafeterias have tables where there's benches and kids can sit on both sides. That can't happen anymore under this guidance. So six feet apart, you get one row of seats, you face the same direction, and you can fit 90 kids at a time for eating. So it didn't make sense to have more kids in the classroom at once, but then have these requirements again in common spaces. Also, there's still strict requirements in some of our classes like band and choir and PE that have to maintain the six feet. So throughout the rest of the year, we're gonna keep our original guidance. And then as we transition to summer school and school in the fall, we'll move towards the three, three feet distance and we will be in compliance. So with that, I just want to give a brief history, and I'm turning it over to Mr. Hagerty, who's going to talk about um, what the school day will look like. Thank you. And uh, just to refer back to Dr. Bernelson, as she indicated, the March 12 proclamation really changed our thinking quickly. And given the nature of our three-period schedule and our courses at secondary, especially in terms of students enrolled in credit-bearing courses needed for graduation, we found the need to think in different terms for student and staff return options at the secondary compared to how we managed elementary. We launched a survey for families just as we did at elementary and asked you for your preference between choosing hybrid in-person learning or staying in distance learning mode for the rest of the year. And as you can see on this slide, 
56% of the total wish to return for that in-person learning offering, 36% wish to stay in distance learning with 8% not responding. Where we didn't get a response, we placed students by default to the in-person version, pending hearing otherwise from families. And we have been hearing from families on this, so that, that's working out. Um, Diane, would you move to the next one? After March 12th, we pulled together at the same time a committee to discuss schedule options for in-person learning. And our decision was to choose a schedule that was designed to stay as close as possible to the work we've been doing throughout this year, engaging with all of our students each day, with students and staff keeping the same classes they have now, and with Wednesdays remaining the same. Our central focus is to maintain the consistency in our schedules and to preserve student and staff relationships, again, notably because we have students who have credit at risk if we were to jumble things up entirely. So to do this, to teach all students with some in the classroom and others remote, daily instruction can take a variety of shapes uh, and we can mix these shapes up. Um, it may involve a whole class check-in with time for independent work. It may involve what we're calling simultaneous teaching, which is engaging all of those learners at that moment, remote and in-person in the same lesson at the same time. Uh, it may involve independent work and then focused individual student support. Or it might also involve splitting the period so that I spend a portion of my time as a teacher focused on my in-person and delivering that lesson, releasing them for independent work, and then doing the same again with my group of students who are in distance learning. So our staff have been engaged in training uh, using all of our technologies and starting and preparing for next Monday's return. And what you'll see moving forward is a variety of all of these very likely as we get more comfortable having students in our classes and remote blending these together uh, as we work through the next nine weeks. The next few slides show the structure of the day that we've landed on and it looks different at the two secondary levels. We originally thought that we could maintain the start and end times that we started this year with, though we soon realized that with all of our grade levels returning to school, the whole system needed to flex in order for us to be able to transport students throughout the, the spectrum to and from school. So the end result for middle school is the move to an 80 minute period, as you can see here, a later start uh, than we've currently been enjoying and a lunch period that occurs within the day. So you will see that there is three periods. There's that limited passing time, which is pretty typical for middle school. And then that lunch period, which in all of our middle schools will likely take three periods or three lunch sessions for each grade level. Um, Diane, if you would go to the next slide. So the key features are the idea of meals and breaks, students having that lunch time on campus. Um, and Dr. Brindlison referenced the, the version of OV where 90 students can have that lunch safely and successfully at any given time. In addition, there's the challenge and the change from being remote to being in person in terms of technology. And so students should bring their district device to and from school each day. And if you're a student or a family who has been using a personal device, you can receive a district device when attending in person on request. At the high school, we also shifted, though the timing is a little bit closer to what we have had this year. Um, and you'll notice we've retained the 90 minute periods. There's no lunch served, but there are two significant passing breaks within which nutrition uh, snacks, uh, nutrition services will be, be offered on the go. So the idea is that students will have that nutrition opportunity. Uh, principals and schools have developed uh, plans so that students can move safely and find safe uh, socially distanced spaces where they can have that nutrition in between classes before going back to learning. Uh, just as with the middle school, key idea is this case is that there will be nutrition to on the go to eat between classes, those extended passing periods of 15 minutes to enable this. And similarly, in terms of technology, students will bring their district devices to and from school each day, and those using personal devices can get a district device at school uh, if they choose to, as they attend in person. Another piece that we've realized is, you know, in a large, our, in our large comprehensive secondary schools, we have lots of classes that we offer to meet kids' unique interests, uh, performing arts and other electives, for example. 
And these demand different types of, of arrangements and different ways of organizing to make it work safely. So our building and our district administrators have been working with staff to develop plans for, for example, performing arts and other electives, plans that will meet student, space, health, and safety parameters, all based on the continuously updated Washington Department of Health guidance. So that's active work that our teachers and our building administrators have been engaging in uh, since we launched this after March the 12th. Um, in this case, Diane, you can go to the next one. You'll, you'll notice that we have different spaces, uh, say for example, a gym. And so class sizes are also limited or there are some parameters based on physical size so that we can ensure physical distancing between and in front of students but also, and Allison referenced this earlier, between students and the instructor. And understandably, there will be variations of this. The band and instrumental music is going to look a little different from the drama, choir, and theater, look a little different from dance and physical education, and then look a little bit different for our CTE classes. But again, we're, we've got good fortune and good guidance coming from the Washington State Department of Health that's very detailed about the distances and what's possible and timing and et cetera. So, a new, a new world for principals and teachers to work together within. Finally, I wanna say a few words about the attestation, that health screening that is done daily. So our staff will attest daily through their own app that we have internally. Um, middle and high school students and families will do their attestations through cumulative family access. High school students actually can attest for themselves, middle school students cannot. So a student who arrives at school with the ad without the attestation We'll, we'll be working through a phone call and a connection with the family to make sure that the student is okay to attend school that day. Our instructions for attestation are available in written form and in several languages, along with a brief demonstration video on our return to school website. And there are paper forms of the attestation available for download on the website or from the school office in hard copy. And all of these are also available in several languages. Temperature checks, it's important to note, are a part of your family student attestation every day. And though this was initially done at the elementary school level, what we learned is that they proved to be unreliable uh, and often not in functional because of the impacts of doing it outside in the weather. So the reminder uh, for our families is that the temperature check is part of your daily attestation process uh, with your students. And it's expected on our end that you are checking your children's temperatures at home as a part of the attestation process each day. Pat, can I add one more thing to, to what you shared? I just wanna share with families too that in the next day or maybe two at the most, a message will be going out to families that includes links to the demonstration videos and the, and the paper forms, as well as the instructions on how to do the daily attestation. So watch for that in your, your email in the next day or two. Thanks. All right, Cindy is up. Thank you. So uh, with the decision of April 19th um, return date, and then also the instructional model of the AB schedule, transportation was then asked to look at um, what, what um, way we could de determine the assignment of AB for students. Uh, some of the factors we wanted to consider was capacity, uh, um, and then also siblings, keeping our siblings together, um, not only at the high school or middle school, but um, if they were in both schools. Uh, looking at that, um, we started kind of geographically looking at capacity because the capacity we were considering, not just the capacity in the buildings, but also capacity on the different modes of travel. So we wanted to balance our load on our buses. And we also wanted to balance congestion and loads um, during the, the walk routes. So uh, we looked at those areas and created a, um, equal split, um, considering again, the sibling factor. Those lists were then sent to these schools um, for them to look at uh, the, the impacts at the building as far as schedules and other resources. Um, and for uh, the last couple of weeks, we've been collaborating back and forth, um, fine tuning those assignments. Uh, and postcards were just sent out today for your bus routes for uh, the um, 
middle school and high school students. So be looking for those in the mail in the next couple of days. The transportation routes for general education are primarily the same as usual. Uh, what is different is um, the bell schedule with, um, with the addition of secondary coming on, we had already had established times for our elementary students and we really wanted to minimize the change to, the, to families. So we looked at creating schedules that would allow us to meet all the different criteria that was already described, but also allowed us uh, our transportation fleet to work. Um, the fleet has to work kind of in a tier system. It takes our entire fleet to provide transportation for each grade grouping. Uh, so the fleet is in full use for high school, then in full use for elementary currently, then full use for middle school. In addition, uh, the guidance from OSBI, the Office of Superintendent, Department of Health, and also Labor and Industry has not um, indicated that we must keep six foot distancing on our school buses. Um, the recommendation and the guidance asks us to consider that when reasonable and then to develop other symptoms mitigations um, to help mitigate uh, risk on transportation. So the AB schedule in itself helped reduce capacity. Uh, but um, when when the buses are uh, when we're when reasonable, we will have kids sit one per seat, or families siblings will sit together. Um, but there may be cases where kids will have to sit together, and that's when the other mitigations come into place. And that is the requirement of masks for all everybody on the bus. Uh, we have increased ventilation um, the old fashioned way by opening windows, roof hatches, um, and getting uh, cross ventilation uh, in a, the buses. We are also loading and unloading um, in a structured way to reduce the amount of time kids pass each other in the aisleways. So first on the bus is going to be on the back. Last on the bus is going to be first off. Again, that reduces the, the time that they have to um, go by each other in the aisle. And then also extra disinfecting um, procedures. We have allowed enough time for quick wipe, wipe downs of high touch points on the buses between routes between loads of students. And then at the end of the day, the entire fleet is receiving a electrostatic uh, disinfectant spray um, with 100% um, coverage of the bus. Thanks, Cindy. All right, this next part, Cindy's gonna continue to talk a bit about safety and cleaning, but we thought it would be fun to uh, have it be a little more engaging. So some of this information you may remember reading in the operational guide or in family messages or the website. So we're gonna test your knowledge just a little bit in a fun way uh, using something called Kahoot. I'm gonna change my screen share so you can see how, how to do that. And you may have even seen your um, children perhaps doing Kahoot in their own classes. All right. So I've also put a link here into, or I am going to put a link. There we go. I put a link to Kahoot in the chat. If you want to open the chat, you can click on it, or you can use a mobile device or some other device here to enter in the www.kahoot.it. When you get there, it's going to ask you for this game pin number. And I see a lot of people are figuring it out already. It will also ask you for a nickname. So you can put in your name or a made up name or anonymous or something like that. And give everybody about 20 more seconds to get signed in. And then I think that there's about eight questions that we'll go through and they are true false questions or multiple choice. And you'll have between 10 and 20 seconds each depending on the, depending on the question. And then after each one, uh, Cindy will chime in with any added information. Great, people are coming in there, great. We do have a few people who are participating by phone, so don't worry, we'll be reading the questions off and the answers. All right, we're gonna get started. So uh, I'm gonna describe this to you here before I hit start, because once we go, the timer starts ticking. So you'll see a question 
And then it goes to the next screen where it shows you the possible answers. And as I mentioned, it could be true or false, or it could be multiple choice. And what you're looking for if you're on a, a device playing along is that you'll see a color and a shape that corresponds with the, the responses. So you're looking for a matching color or a matching shape to the correct answer. So here we go. So the first question is, True or false, students are required to wear masks during class and on the bus. So again, true or false, you wanna be clicking either the blue true or the red false. The correct answer is true. Just about everybody got that right. Absolutely, everybody is required to wear masks during class and on the bus. The exceptions would be during any eating time on campus or taking drinks of water. Cindy, anything to add before we go to the next one? Good job team, it's looking strong. <laughs> so far so good. All right, next question is, which should be used to clean technology? So your district devices, would it be soap and water, alcohol-based wipes, Clorox wipes from home, or a Solsta 730 cleaner? The correct answer is alcohol-based wipes. That's a tricky one, but it's a good one to know. A lot of cleaners are not intended for technology, so be sure to use alcohol-based wipes only. Next one, students must maintain six feet of distance even when passing each other in the hallways. True or false? The correct answer is actually false. And I'm gonna kick it over to Cindy to explain why. Absolutely, this is a tricky one. So, and, and the key here is it's while passing in the halls. So anytime students are in transition, we're gonna be encouraging them to be six foot apart and we'll be providing that supervision, but um, they may be closer than six feet in transition. And it's okay when that happens because they have the masks on. So that's another layer, layer of safety that is taking place. The key to, uh, and the times that, kid, that the students have to maintain that six foot is anytime they're in a stopped position or they're in a, a, a set position, such as classroom when they're at their desk. But times of transition, they can go in and out of six feet as long as they have their masks on properly. Thanks, Cindy. All right, next question. Oh, sorry, see the results here. Whoever is the ellipses, the three dots is doing pretty well. Next question, true or false? Students can bring their own Clorox wipes to clean classroom surfaces. True or false? The correct answer is false. Um, Cindy, you wanna add a little more about that? Anything to add? Well, again, just make sure that we're using the approved surfaces a little later in the demonstration. We'll talk about some of those that we have for students on site, but um, it's important to remember the safety and balance between disinfecting and also putting too many of those chemicals out there in our environment. Thanks. Next question, after an absence, I must contact the school before my child returns to school. True or false? Correct answer is true. It looks like most people got that yet, yeah, right. And um, that's for the school to make sure uh, that there was nothing related to COVID or any concern about symptoms that might be yeah, related to that. So um, yes, we are asking families to, to clear it with the office before their student can, can return back to school after an absence.
Next question. If my child tests positive for COVID-19, I should notify the school ASAP as soon as possible. True or false? I'm guessing we're gonna have a good, a good ratio on this one. The correct answer is true indeed. Please do notify the school ASAP. If they test positive, uh, they will, uh, the school will also notify uh, Snohomish Health District as well. So please do notify the school as soon as possible if you, your child um, does receive any positive results for COVID-19 test. Ellipses, person is undefeated, pretty amazing. Who is allowed at athletic games as of just this week or last week? Staff, home team spectators, players, or all of the above? All of the above is the correct answer. So this is a little bit different. Um, I will mention too that they are at reduced capacities. So if you want to be sure, depending on what sport, where it's located, uh, you can check your school's athletic page and they should have that information for you. And also note, I believe they are still streaming all of those activities too, if you choose to watch it by um, via streaming. Thanks, Cindy. All right, last question, true or false? If one student tests positive for COVID-19, the school will shut down for one day. True or false? The correct answer is false. And Cindy, you want to talk, talk a little more about this? Absolutely. We will follow uh, guidance from Snohomish Health District um, regarding this, and we will follow our response plans with disinfecting protocols um, and, and isolation or review of the areas um, that, that would require extra uh, disinfecting. So, but Ultimately, um, this is something that we, a decision that we make in combination with the Homish Health District. And I'll just add on there too, that, that part of the uh, contact tracing is identifying anyone who was a close contact. So not necessarily the whole school and maybe in some cases, not even the whole classroom. So it's gonna really depend on the situation and who that um, student or staff member was identified to have a close contact with. Um, that will all depend. All right, that was the last question. So let's just see, just for kicks, who are top three winners? Dad, well done. I'm enjoying the library land. I'm really enjoying the names here. And our, I think our friend Ellipses, three dots. Well done, everybody. Well, thanks for playing along. I appreciate it. Hopefully that was a little bit more interesting um, than just hearing it through the PowerPoint. However, we do have some information here to get back to. And it's going back to Cindy to finish up safety. All right, thank you. Uh, so we are gonna continue talking about safety and the layered approach. This is um, a really important um, concept of, of how we are uh, providing safety protocols um, and how you are part of the team. One of the very first things on the attestation or on this layered approach is the attestation. That is the act um, that staff and you as the families take the time to make sure that um, your students are well um, before they come to school, well and have not had any close contact. Um, that's great because what that allows us through that initial screening, it allows us then once we're inside the building um, to be focused on instructing the students um, that are well. And, and, um, and then we have the other safety protocols in place to help mitigate. Um, for some reason, if conditions change, if a student becomes symptomatic, um, we then have the distancing, we have the ventilation, um, the, the protocols like hand washing and mask wearing. So all of those items are a layered approach. Um, and it's, it's um, really a all hands-on approach that we're, we're all working together to maintain those layers of safety.
We've also, um, throughout the, the closure and then returning, the custodial team has been very busy um, updating practices and following guidance as far as cleaning protocols in our buildings. Uh, I think one of the best things they've done that's been, been extremely effective is the development of student-friendly wipes. These wipes are um, soap and water-based, and CDC has um, provided guidance that says that soap and water is extremely effective, um, up to like 99% effective um, in reducing the spread um, through, through touch. Uh, so, and it, it's also extremely good because guidance has told us to make sure that we're, um, we're being aware and balancing the amount of chemicals um, that, that we're putting into our environment. So this allows us to um, incorporate the students into our plan uh, and actually wipe down the surfaces as they come into the space and as they leave the space. Staff can use this, students can use this. So again, it's, it's everybody participating um, to provide that extra layer of, of cleaning um, with these soap and water wipes. Uh, in addition, the custodial team has worked to kind of develop new structures and how their workloads. Um, it's a full-time job before COVID to clean our building. So um, they needed to be creative and intentional on um, maintaining that the cleaning side of uh, their operations, but then also designated um, staff and times for disinfectant and wiping down of the high touch points. They've also uh, developed a team that is available to respond if needed. If we have a, um, a case where there might be a symptomatic person or some sort of an exposure, um, they're prepared to go in um, using um, additional cleaning, disinfecting procedures um, to, to cover those particular areas. Training has been a um, very important component um, uh, for all of our plans. Um, we uh, staff, as they return, they will be receiving training covering um, really that layered approach from the very beginning of the attestation process. Um, it's just as important that we ensure that when they come on site, they're well. Uh, so training starts with that. Um, and we've we've shared that training with families also. Uh, we've pre uh, created a lot of videos. You can go to the staff uh, or to the district website and look at different videos um, on hand hygiene, on how to wear a mask, just help get your students prepared for back to, to school. Um, and in addition, our nurses have been working, um, providing training for PPE, uh, what PPE is appropriate to use and how to wear it. Um, just as simply, you know, for some people, um, wearing a mask, uh, it, it's not just wearing the mask, it's making sure you're wearing the mask properly and you're fully covering below your chin and your nose area. So we have staff that's, that's trained um, and prepared to help students in as they acclimate back into the on-site set, setting. One of the kind of final pieces of our, our plan is our response plan. In situations where we have that maybe uh, someone has become symptomatic or um, there's really three different scenarios. It may be a symptomatic person, someone's became sick. It could be a confirmed case, we know they're positive, or maybe it's a confirmed um, close contact, someone in the house is has been positive. So we've developed a team, the COVID site supervisor, along with the building nurse and the director of safety, myself, in collaboration with the Snohomish Health District, um, to really review these cases um, case by case and, and ask the questions. Uh, we need, um, it, it's really developing a timeline and developing um, all of the, the, the paths of travel and the contacts. So just looking at every, every case um, individually and determining the next co course of action. Um, that may be quarantine, it may be isolation, and then also um, the dis different disinfecting procedures that we need to follow up with. All right, that's me. All right, now you've heard a lot of information here this evening. And so we have an opportunity here. We have just under 20 minutes left for us to gather any remaining questions or your thoughts or comments about uh, the middle and high school in-person learning. We're gonna use Thought Exchange for that. Uh, if you've not used Thought Exchange, here's how this works. And I'm gonna try to talk through it as I share my screen and get you over there. What you'll do, 
is in the chat box. I put the link or you can hold up a cell phone and get the scan code or you can go to the website and enter in that code number to participate. So um, lots of ways to join in. Uh, the question, of course, is what remaining thoughts or questions do you have about in-person learning? We're going to have about six minutes for you to enter in any of those questions or thoughts. Once you've entered in, you can enter in one, you can enter in none, or you can enter in five. So there's no limit um, to how many questions that you can ask or enter in there. Uh, and then you'll get a chance to rate um, other people's questions or thoughts. So the more stars you give somebody else's thoughts, that means that you agree with it. Uh, the fewer the stars that you give somebody else's comment means that maybe it just doesn't really resonate with you, um, not as high on your list for questions. Um, what we'll get back here is we'll get the most widely held questions or comments, the most highly rated up on top, and then we'll begin to answer those uh, and go through as many as we can before the time is up. So with that, I can see there's already a few people in. I'm going to go ahead and start the timer here for six minutes. And we'll be able to start to see these coming in. I'll put on a little bit of background, quiet background music while you're doing that.
Okay, one more minute. So this is a good time to make sure you have some time to rate other people's comments if you haven't already. Okay, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and close this. And thank you very much for your participation. You can see right up at the top, it looks like 136 people participated. That's about half as many, uh, just under half of the number of people that we have on the webinar tonight. Um, 111 thoughts and 2,725 ratings. So that's that's great. Um, it gives us some great questions and comments to work with here. So you can see the rating. We're just gonna start right here at the top and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Looks like we've got about 10, 10 minutes here to do that. So this first one, um, can students have the option to eat outside? Um, and I think the short answer is yes, but um, Patty or Pat, anything to add here before we go to the next? Well, I will, for middle school particularly, the, our lunch settings are gonna be set up to be internal, but the, with an external option, uh, it's gonna differ by location. Harbor Point's gonna look a little bit different from Voyager. So that direction specifically will be given at the school level uh, for students. But yeah, we wanna create as much space for kids to have the option to eat safely outside, recognizing our cafeterias are gonna be socially distanced and safe for their lunches. Thank you. And I might add, just because this is farther down the line, I don't know if I made it up, but you are able to bring your own lunch or own snacks. Um, but you'll just have to uh, follow the guidelines as to where to eat and when. And just to piggyback on that, Patty, if uh, the if students choose to eat the food provided by the school, it is free of charge to everybody, correct? Yes, it's free of charge to eat at the school, and it does not prohibit you from also attending one of the off-site um, times to go pick up your meals for five days. You can do both if you want. Super, thank you. At no charge. Thank you. Uh, next question, if a student isn't able to attend in person, can they attend the Zoom schedule that day? I'm going to be Absol Absolutely. The answer is we want them to, and it's the same schedule. So it's all of our students at one time. So if I'm an in-person student and, you know, I sleep in, I don't get up early enough, and I'm just going to Zoom in from home, absolutely, that's the expectation. And our attendance will reflect that they're an in-person student who is just Zooming in remotely for that date. There was another question I saw about, is there a different schedule for the Zoomers versus the rumors, as we say? It is one schedule. So if you're a middle schooler, your day starts at 10, 15 for everybody and continues on till three o'clock. Perfect, thank you. We're proactively answering some of these apparently. We, well done, well done. Uh, how will students know where to go for their classes? Pat, this might also be a question that you could help answer. I think that is the best question I've ever seen in uh, Thought Exchange. Um, so I don't know exactly the, the correct answer. My assumption is that it's in cumulative family access or student access. So we haven't had an explicit conversation about that. And I saw somebody noted that they hadn't been notified. I work directly with the principals and that is the first thing I'm gonna send them this evening and follow up with tomorrow. Uh, but start by looking in student access and cumulative family access for the location. That's typically where it is. And I, I do know that there is information in family access that includes uh, what schedule, the, the instructional mode, whether they're in-person or distance learning, and I believe their schedule, whether they're an A, in the A group or the B group. Um, so I know that much at, at a minute. So, thanks. 
Uh, we answered the cafeteria question and we answered that one. Um, I think we've answered that one as well. Can I, yeah, we got that one. Here we go. Uh, if I fill out the electronic attestation on cumulative for my middle schooler, how does he access it on his device to show at the school entrance? That's a great question. So there's a couple ways that you can do that. Um, and again, in the message that's going out to families in the next day or two, it'll have some instructions. But one thing it says is that um, students, even though middle school students can't do their own self attestation, they can log in to family access to access the results. So in other words, they should be able to reach the, res the positive response response message and show it on their district device or their phone uh, on their way into school. Another way would be a screenshot. So if a parent say, does their attestation for their middle schooler on their device or their phone, they could snap a screenshot of that. It shows the student's name. It shows the date and the result of the attestation. You could send that screenshot and then your, your student could show it on their phone or device uh, on the way in that way as well. All right, we got that one. Okay, if students are eating during passing time in high school, how are they keeping safe with six feet distance and not wearing masks? That's a great question to delineate between passing time versus eating time. And I'm thinking that's a Pat and or Patty question. Pat, you wanna start? Sure, so I'm thinking of a, one particular high school where I've been talking with the principal about their plan. And so they have designated specific areas that they're gonna direct their students to go to. There are gonna be areas that will be inside the building that are socially spaced. They've got you know, places for kids to stand and signage uh, indicating what's appropriate there, but then also external to the building where kids can get out. And again, be socially distanced and take off their masks. We're, we're, we're anticipating kids not in motion, removing the mask and eating. Uh, so we're gonna guide them to go to a safe space and do it. You know, as people who work with adolescents in large numbers, we know that that's gonna require constant vigilance and support on our end. Right, and I'll just dovetail on that. We will be providing supervision to help direct students to those locations. So we don't anticipate them walking down the hallway, eating their sandwich. <laughs> Um, what we do is we'll have them going to a designated area, all facing one way, six foot apart, um, eating in those designated areas. So, but a good question, because it's kind of hard to visualize. Yeah, it is a good question and good answer. Thank you very much. Um, this next one is similar to one we answered, but I want to add something that I learned from Cindy just a little while ago. Um, one other way is that a lot of schools are using good to go passes. So once a student walks through, uh, enters the school campus and is able to show their attestation results, uh, they're giving them a good to go pass or a stamp or something like that, that they can then if, if asked or as they enter the classroom, they can show that and the teacher or other staff members will know that they're cleared to be on campus that day. Not to be confused with the good to go pass in the carpool lane, though. It's a Makotio good to go. Yeah, ours, ours are free. <laughs> there's, there's no monthly bill that comes for those. Um, is there going to be some kind of orientation for new students? I do know that some schools are working on those and um, creating videos or other things to share with uh, students and families to help orient them. Um, I don't have a way of knowing if every school is doing them or how they're doing them. So I would say that yes, um, but check with your, your school. They're probably uh, scrambling to finish it and get it out to, to families this week would be my guess. And I would add to that, that some will be doing it and publishing it in advance. Some will be taking time at the start of that first day to orient all the students at once, either with a video or a PowerPoint presentation or something along those lines. Great, thanks. Uh, so we answered the snacks question. We got answered the eat question. Uh, sixth graders, what disciplinary actions will be taken for students that do not follow safety guidelines? This is a, a good Bruce question. Yeah, all the secondary schools um, have been instructed to review their student behavior plans um, and specifically to discuss the, the safety elements involved in uh, returning to in-person. Um, so it would include if, uh, how we're going to respond to students who are not wearing their mask properly, or maybe they're not they're taking them off inappropriately, um, as well as any other um, safety violations. Um, so those will be handled at the building level. Um, I will say that for students who consistently do not cooperate with mask wearing, um, we may reassign them to remote learning. 
Thanks, Bruce. Okay, and the next one is the same, pretty much the same question. So thank you for answering those. Uh, next question is my son's ba computer battery doesn't last very long. Should they bring their charger? That's a great question for Brooke. Love to answer that. Um, so number one, if your uh, student's battery is not lasting long enough at home, uh, make your school aware of it. And we can get it switched out for a computer that has that battery lasts longer. Maybe there's something wrong with the battery. But yes, students should bring their chargers each day to school. Um, we'll have a couple extra. We'll have some extras out in the buildings for students that maybe forget their charger. And we'll have uh, places within the classroom to charge laptops throughout the day. Great, thanks Brooke. Uh, what are the exact protocols for close contact cases? Cindy, this probably is closest to your, your wheelhouse. Can you talk maybe a little more about if somebody is identified or maybe, and I'm not exactly clear on if the person is how, asking how they are identified as a close contact, but I think we could at least talk about the protocol for what happens if, all right, there's a positive case. Absolutely. So uh, if there's a positive case, um, the first thing we do is begin an investigation. Uh, and, and that is working with um, the positive person um, and uh, any other staff that is in the area. Um, what we're looking for is to determine um, where, what, what paths of travel, um, what areas uh, the positive person was in, um, and any people that were possibly um, closer than six feet for 15 minutes um, period of time, and that's cumulative. Um, so we're really looking, and as we're as we're looking at the interactions throughout the day, staff to staff or staff to student, um, is maintaining the proper PPE use, maintaining physical distancing, um, and then when we, there are times when we have to get closer than the six feet, keeping it under that 15 minutes cumulative window. Um, anything under that doesn't require quarantining. Um, if we determine that there has been a close contact, then we will do communication to um, all the people that it was determined um, close contact. We will notify you um, and also Snohomish Health District. So we report all of that to Snohomish Health District and then they follow their protocol. Ultimately, the determination is through um, Snohomish Health District. So but it's a collaboration uh, and then you will be notified by them. Um, and potentially also by the district, if it's been determined, determined that you potentially were a close contact. Thanks, Cindy. Diane, I just want to note that Patty, if we have time, had to go back. I don't know if you saw that. I just did. Yep. Okay. Patty, you wanted to go back and clarify something about hot lunch, right? Yeah. I just wanted to clarify what we mean at the middle school level for hot lunch, that it's not your typical hot lunch on a tray. It will be a... I'm going to use this as an example, but a, a warm entree. So like a hamburger warmed up, um, but will be pre-wrapped. So it won't be your typical tray look. I just wanted to clarify that because people are confused when they see hot lunch. Thanks, Patty. Well, we are unfortunately at the end of our time. However, we all of the questions that were gathered here, we still have access to those. So we can continue to go through um, and, and as possible, we can weave in answers to those questions in future family communications. Um, so thank you for participating in that. Um, before we wrap up, I'm gonna ask Dr. Brunelson, do you wanna wrap up with any closing remarks? I, I do, but first I feel really compelled to answer these questions about refilling water bottles and going to the bathroom because those are basic needs. So I'm going to ask Karen, are students going to be allowed to refill their water bottles or are drinking fountains turned off? Um, we are working on that solution right now. Their students will have access to water and uh, if they bring a water bottle, there will be a way to fill it. Um, and of course our restrooms are open and, um, there will be signage at, you know, cause every restroom looks a little bit different. Every school looks a little bit different. So there's going to be a lot of signage, uh, to help inf instruct the students where they need to stand in line to potentially wait for the restroom. If it's a limited number of people allowed in there and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I, I couldn't rest without answering those questions. So I appreciate that. So students that are on listening and um, are listening and participated in Thought Exchange, thank you. I know we are so looking forward to seeing you in person and parents that are listening, thank you so much for all that you have done to support your students during this last year, this last difficult year. And we're so excited to have students return in person 
And um, just thank you for attending and thanks for all you do. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks for joining us.